for sure. And uh, so it's really our pleasure to have Konstantin Eder today. Um, I have to say that he is perhaps one of the youngest speaker of our, in our forum. He has just finished his PhD, I think, last week. He has defended his thesis last week. And um, he uh, he's an expert in loop quantum gravity and uh, various aspects of non-perturbative aspects of quantum gravity. And he comes from uh, FAU Erlangen Nuremberg, um, which is very close to, I believe, um, not very, kind of like middle of Germany, um, <laughs> fairly middle. <laughs> um, so yeah, so floor is all yours, Konstantin. And uh, so he's going to tell us something very basic aspects of loop quantum gravity. Please, Konstantin, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Anupam. And also thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really great pleasure and to have the opportunity to, to give a talk on this forum. Also today, I would like to give a broad introduction to uh, loop quantum gravity. In this context, I would also like to talk about some intriguing idea arising from this formalism by interpreting space as kind of a molecule built up from uh, basic uh, quantized geometrical atoms, which is some quite uh, fascinating uh, result which follows from this formalism quite naturally. But uh, does it work? Okay. okay. But uh, before I go over to look on gravity at the beginning, I would to give a, a introduction to quantum gravity, a brief introduction to quantum gravity as a whole. Now, uh, modern physics is based on uh, two very successful fundamental theories. On the one hand, we have quantum field theory, which describes the subatomic particles and inter interaction processes. On the other hand, we have uh, general relativity, which describes uh, physics at the microscopic scales. Now, quantum field theory is best understood on a perturbative level, which leads to the notion of uh, so-called Feynman diagrams, which can be used, for instance, to, con uh, to, uh, um, to compute scattering amplitudes. And there exist, in fact, two approaches. On one hand, one has the covariant approach, which is based on a path integral formulation. On the other hand, one has the canonical approach, which is based on a Metonian formulation. But there's a big issue because this, uh, this approach is, uh, is based on, uh, heavily on the choice of background metric. And so it is not clear how to uh, combine this, these quantum field theory techniques on two field theories where the metric turns out to be dynamical, such as in case of gravity, which is described by the general theory of relativity. And there, according to the Einstein field equations, it now follows that the energy and matter distribution in the universe not directly affects the metric and thus the geometry of space time. So the metric in this formalism is indeed not fixed and actually effectively uh, turns out to be dynamical. But also an issue because there are singularities appearing, for instance, in the interior of the coals or the Big Bang singularity at the beginning of the expansion of the universe. And all these point out that actually we have to somehow uh, combine quantum gravity with the concept of uh, quantum uh, uh, generativity with the concept of quantum field theory. But now, since the metric is dynamical, we cannot apply the standard quantization techniques. Of course, one could try to quantize gravity uh, perturbatively, but also there one finds that uh, and actually one runs into problems. Uh, because the theory turns out to be non realizable leading to a non protective theory at Planck scale. So, all this points out that actually we have to develop fundamentally new methods or ideas to formulate the quantum theory of gravity. And currently, the most promising candidates to formulate such a theory are given by the superstring theory or M theory and loop quantum gravity, which I would like to uh, talk about today. But also, there are other approaches, such as, for instance, uh, causal set theory or asymptotic safety. But I have concentrated on these two approaches. In the following, we'll talk more about this loop quantum gravity approach. Now, uh, superstring theory, very briefly, is based on the idea that metric particles may regard as certain excitations of one dimensional vibrating strings, so one has uh, open strings and also closed strings. And now, to, to, uh, to this idea that now point particles are blown up to uh, strings of finite length, loop diagrams are blown up to surfaces, and that's the, way, that's the reason why it's a conjecture that the theory might be. Deep, uh, I uh, find it in the ultraviolet in the perturbative level. But in order to formulate a consistent theory, it actually has to impose supersymmetry and even higher space time dimensions. But uh, there's also a caveat in the theory because the formulation is based on the choice of a background metric. So it's not, probably not clear how to reconcile this with the standard principles of, uh, uh, of uh, general relativity. And this is indeed the basic uh, guiding principle of loop quantum gravity. Because now loop quantum gravity is a non perturbative approach to quantum gravity. In particular, does not make choice of any background metric. And classically, it starts uh, with the reformulation of the canonical phase space of GR in terms of new variables, the so-called Ashtekar-Bobera variables, consisting of a SO2 gauge field A 
for the code the ASU2, uh, the, uh, the Ashdecker connection, and it's kind of like a conjugate momentum E quadrilactic field. And both depend on some parameter beta, which is some free, and this is so-called a MISI parameter, and this is some free parameter of the theory. In this way, one finds that this gives canonical GI the kinematical structure of ASU2 Young less gauge theory. Based on this observation, this motivates the quantization technique, which I will explain in more detail in what follows, uh, uh, by inspired by lattice QCD. So main, main basic building blocks of the theory can regard a certain, a certain string -like excitations, which are obtained by the action of so-called Wilson loop operators on a vacuum state. So this way one gets uh, these, uh, these loops, which are obtained uh, in terms of uh, the parallel transport map used by this SU2, uh, SU2 connection A along one dimensional closed loops alpha, which are labeled by certain spin quantum numbers J. And these yes, second, if I may ask, so yeah. these uh, Wilson loops uh, essentially, or the operators here, uh, essentially they become non-local. Yes. So uh, does it mean that in uh, in uh, in Ashtaker's approach, the non-locality is inbuilt somehow in the construction? Uh, yes. Um... Yeah, the theory is uh, is uh, unlocal in this sense because we have to impose the morphism covariance, and this way it's indeed completely unlocal. Yeah. This comes from uh, the requirement of the morphism covariance. Okay, okay, yeah. Please. But somehow one can talk about locality uh, studying the spin network vertices. Mm -hmm. so in this context, one can talk about locality, but you yeah. know. But this uh, this operator which you have shown is essentially non-local. Yeah, this one is non-local. Yeah. Thanks. What, what is the pi j here? The pi sub j. Pi j is an usual was uh, an irep of SU two, so some representations of SU two, finite one. So this can you can be combined with this uh, with this uh, paratransport, which is some SU two gauge uh, SU two group element. I see. I see. Okay. So these uh, wisdom loops, uh, besides uh, group, this uh, the string, are labeled by some quantum number, spin quantum number j. This is our loops. This actually gives loop con gravity its name. So loop con gravity, we have these loops as basic building blocks. So can I think of the pi j's like things like uh, Pauli matrices um, or, or spin matrices and and uh, e is this uh, kind of uh, well, uh, SU two version of electromagnetic field uh, kind of thing. Yeah, for instance, for uh, the uh, spin one half representation, these are uh, these Pauli matrices. So exponential of Pauli matrices. Right, right, and and the pi j's would also be Pauli some other Pauli matrices then. Uh, yeah, so uh, generalizations of this. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so symmetric tensor products of them, and so all irreducible irreducible representations you can build out of these spin one half representations. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I would like to explain this in more detail, this, uh, how this picture arises in the formalism. So in the following, uh, I would like to, so this was a brief induction to quantum gravity as a whole, and now I would like to explain in more detail what the main aspects of loop quantum gravity. In particular, I would like to talk about uh, the so-called host action of gravity, and then uh, the main, main basic algebra of the theory, so-called quantum flux algebra, and then uh, basic building blocks of the quantum theory, which are given by the so-called spin network states, and then also the picture that arises from them, so-called uh, the, so the, the quantization of geometry, which leads to the quantization of area and volume, and also the dynamics of the theory to notions of so-called spin forms. And all this will explain what follows. In the end, uh, depending on how much time I will have, I will also talk about my own research and how to combine or apply loop quantum gravity techniques to the context of supergravity. Okay. Now exists, in fact, various approaches uh, to loop quantum gravity. Uh, so one has the so on one hand, one has the so-called canonical approach, which is based on Hamiltonian formulations so or quantization on three-dimensional hypersurfaces, and then studying the corresponding Hamiltonian dynamics to regain a covariant picture of the theory. On the other hand, one also has a covariant approach, uh, which is based on quantization of the four-dimensional theory from the beginning using path and loop techniques. And in the beginning, let me talk about the canonical theory. Later on, we'll also talk about uh, the co covariant approach. Now, the canonical approach is based on the uh, discovery of Abay Ashtika, who found that uh, GR can be formulated in a way such that, uh, such that the non reduced symplectic phase space of the canonical classical theory is that of SO2 Young Less Cage theory, as I said previously. Interestingly, similar observations can be done in, in higher space and dimensions, which was found by Bundy, Gottiman, and Tuan. And in context of space and dimensions, one finds that 
This arises from the so-called host action of gravity. So the host action is some kind of a one parameter family of deformed actions of first Einstein gravity. And deformation is uh, induced by the music parameter beta. And this host action decomposes into the standard action of first order Einstein gravity. So we have these uh, co-frame fields, which induce the metric on space-time by contraction of the internal indices with, uh, with respect to the Minkowski metric. Minkowski metric, and also in uh, the curvature of uh, the, some Royce connection omega. And additionally, one has some beta-dependent term, which is the so-called host term. And this term turns out to be a topological at second order. So this is kind of a theta term, similar to quantum chromodynamics. And beta is some kind of uh, aware, uh, some theta parameter. But this is in fact just an analogy. We will we actually encountered some uh, an explicit and an, an exact correspondence in context of supergravity. Maybe I have some time to explain this. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, this, um, I mean, the action or other mm -hmm. other uh, version of the uh, actions of look uh, on gravity uh, usually don't uh, include matter. Do you, I mean, physically consider that uh, space time has a physical existence without matter? Uh, this depends on the pro on the approach you're considering. So, on the canonical approach, one has succeeded in also to include uh, meta degrees of freedom. So, in the canonical approach, we actually the whole standard model has been implemented in the theory. But the uh, but in the covariant approach, this is not clear. So, the covariant approach, which uses uh, the inter this reinterpretation re invitation of this host action in terms of a constraint topological field theory. There one had not yet found a, 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 a possibility to include metal piece of freedom, at least not in the non supersymmetric setting. But this depends on the approach you are considering. In the canonical approach, one has succeeded in including the whole standard model. Okay, thank you. I will explain this also a bit in the following. Now, uh, since this term is here now, this host term is topological second order, this now uh, leads to the same equation of motion as Einstein gravity. So this indeed leads back to gravity. And now since uh, look on gravity is a canonical approach, we now assume that the space time is global, uh, globally hyperbolic. So one assumes that space time M is topologically of the form I times sigma with sigma some three dimensional quotient at the surface. And then one can decompose this host action and then one finds that uh, this leads to the, this, this kinematical term, which depends on fun, uh, the fundamental variables A and E, with A the uh, Ashtika connection, which is a 2 connection on, on sigma, and it's con canonically conjugate momentum E, which is called the electric field. And this contains some, it depends on the metric Q on, uh, on sigma. So E encodes the geometry of, of space. And additionally, one has certain constraints. So on the one hand, one has the so-called Gauss constraint, which generates infinitesimal gauge transformations. And on the other hand, one has uh, diff the diffeomorphism constraint, which generates infinitesimal diffeomorphism transformations. And finally, one has the Newtonian constraint, which governs the dynamics of the theory. And thus, by uh, imposing the constraints on the syntactic phase space and studying the corresponding Hamiltonian equation of motions, well, then the finds that this in fact, in fact leads back to the Einstein field equations. Um, sorry, Constantine, could you yeah. tell me what was that E again? The E? The E is, is the, uh, the canon canonically conjugate momentum of this uh, Gaustika connection A. Okay. And it depends on the metric of space sigma. So it can code somehow the geometry of space. Right. Okay. I will. Back to what Huri was saying, right. if you, you say that. You you are including mass or not including mass? You just did you say that there was a distinction there? And mass, you mean? You think? Did you say mass theory? I think maybe I misheard. Sorry, I sometimes. Yeah, no, 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 no mass. Okay, not so worry. Yeah. Okay. It's just Einstein gravity. Yeah. Ordinary Einstein gravity. We will see later on how this imposes quantization of geometry later on. So how this E field is connected to the quantization of geometry. Okay. Now, in order to construct a quantum theory, one considers representations of a certain on a Hilbert space of a certain classical algebra encoding the physical piece of freedom of this theory. 
And in context of Lucan gravity, this classical algebra is given by the so-called holonomy flux algebra, holonomy flux algebra. And there, this algebra is the construction of this algebra is based on the idea on of the central principle of background independence and uh, gauge invariance. And so, since A defines as a two connection, it is, it is natural to associate it uh, the corresponding the induced uh, parallel transport map along one-dimensional closed loops alpha, and uh, labeled by additional irreducible representations of the SO2 gauge group leading to the uh, Wilson loop observables. And since the electric field is naturally associated to a two-form field, we, uh, it's natural to uh, integrate this or so smear this over, over two-dimensional surfaces embedded in sigma and uh, contract the internal index with respect to some smearing function on, defined on the surface. This leads to the notion of so-called flux quantity, so electric flux quantity. And now these Wilson loops and electric fluxes build up the, uh, the basic building blocks of the, uh, of the classical economy flux algebra. So we can define an, uh, on a product on this algebra, so we can uh, define the product between two Wilson loops. And also one can uh, um, uh, implement a product between uh, the electric flux and the Wilson loop, which is induced by uh, the uh, Poisson bracket on the classical phase space. And for instance, the product between electric flux and the Wilson loop Leads, uh, leads to uh, creates a new internal index of the at the Wilson loop and contracts this with the uh, with the smearing function evaluated at the point of intersection between the Wilson loop and the surface. And also one has a certain product between two electric flux quantities. So this leads to a well-defined closed algebra, so-called only flux algebra of the classical theory, which encodes the, uh, the, the, the physical degrees of freedom of the theory. And now for the construction of the quantum theory, we now study certain representations of this algebra onto a grid space. And that context one finds that the uh, up to unitary equivalence, the only possible represent representation which, uh, which contains a diffeomorphism in invariant vacuum state is given by the so called Ashtika Lewandowski representation. And this, uh, this representation can be regarded as kind of a fog like representation. But in co contrast to the standard quantization techniques of quantum field theory, this quantization scheme is now uh, manifestly background independent. So there's no metric used anywhere. And also in this uh, fog like representation, one has a vacuum state, which is a diffeomorphism brain vacuum state. And on this Hilbert space, the Wilson loop quantities are now implemented. And in, yeah, that's the question, I think. Yeah, sorry. Um, on this. On this point about no background geometry being used anywhere, was the eta ij that you defined earlier mm -hmm. when you were defining what the metric was, you contracted it with the um, the local frame? Is that arguably not a background geometry? Yeah, so this uh, meaning that is dynamical, so we do not choose a background metric. So this uh, e, the metric, the geometry is still encoded in the e, but e is some dynamical object in the theory. So we do not fix the geometry at this point. Oh, I meant the, uh, I was referring to the, the eta that was used to contract the e's rather than um, these themselves uh, it's arguably not a background geometry oh, uh, a so couple slides before i think uh one more uh there at the bottom uh metric jimmy and you yeah. is eta ij is that eta not arguably a background geometry obviously not in physical space but in um so13 space uh so the E's, the co-frames indeed induce a metric, but these E's are a priori completely dynamical. So we do not fix these E's. Sorry, again, I'm, I'm not, maybe not being clear. I'm not referring to the E's specifically, I'm referring to the eaters that we're using to contract them. Uh, the eaters the ether are, is still, a, is still a, a sort of, there's a sort of geometry still encoded in the eaters there. Yeah, just that we have a Lorentzian geometry. So we have to fix, uh, so the, uh, the geometry is Lorentzian, so we have the Minkowski metric. But this does not impose any any uh, any geometry at this point because we have to also uh, fix these uh, these uh, these co-frames in order to get the geometry on space time. Okay. Thank you. So just the information that we have learned in geometry is fixed. All right. Thanks. So, so just let me ask something more on that slightly. So so does that mean that you're assuming uh, like four D space time? as usual here yeah so here it's a 4d space time yes but so, we, so you are uh, yeah so so there is a kind of is there kind of 4d minkowski space time and on that uh, these e, ei mu and ej new are fields or 
that's not a right kind of way to think about it. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, somehow these frames, so these co-frames diagonalize this metric G, so we can, uh, so this line symmetric G has, uh, can be, can be, uh, um, uh, can be uh, decomposed in terms of uh, some kind of eigenstates, so which uh, doggalize this in terms of the Minkowski metric. So it's easier just certain choice mm -hmm. of frame fields on space time, so tangent vectors at each point of space time that doggalize this metric. Mm -hmm. So these are specific choices of, 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 uh, of tangent vectors which have nice property that doggalize the metric. I think it's fair to say that IJs are not part of the manifold as such. I mean, they are in a SU2 space. And uh, as long as the manifold is smooth and it's C infinite, um, everything is uh, background independent. Mm. So this, this integration of the man over the manifold, what kind of manifold is that? Yeah, uh, so this, uh, we, uh, yeah, this, so, um, so the formulation is uh, based on, uh, on uh, so we have some chosen uh, uh, space time, smooth space time manifold. By the end, we, re so, so in this case, we just choose a topolo topology, but at the end, we impose uh, this uh, diffomorphism covariance, so and this way we get, uh, we, we get, uh, we somehow get this, um, this background independent idea so that we don't have to, we do not choose any uh, topology at the beginning. So, the, yeah, so we regain this picture of a reconstruction of space time out of uh, main, main building blocks. But at this stage, we did choose some fixed topology. Okay, okay. But to so regain so this uh, background independent idea by, by imposing these constraints. So, so it is not exactly like you have some abstract Hilbert space and from that you're constructing the, the space time. It's a bit more like you have assumed some manifold. Some, mm -hmm. uh, is, is that right way to think about it? Yeah, we have some, yeah. So it's not, so the manifold is not built up from, uh, from some quantum theory at this stage. Uh, I, I see, I see. I see. But, we, but we get this picture Mm -hmm. uh, on the other way, so uh, yeah, there are different approaches how to get this picture. Okay. So, okay. so in this canonical approach, we start with a given uh, cl cl classical theory, mm -hmm. and then we regain this uh, interpretation of deriving the space time manifold in terms of main building blocks, quantized building blocks. Mm -hmm. But there's also another approach, for instance, quantum, uh, this um, uh, group field theory approach, which really starts with the idea to get space time in terms of uh, some effective picture from quantized planetary atoms. Okay, 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 yeah, please go on, please go on. Yeah. But this is more a top to bottom approach, this is more a bottom to top approach, yeah, the other way around. Okay, now we have this uh, fog like representation, and on this presentation, we have a vacuum state, and also, and now in the Silbert space, the Wilson loop observables act in terms of creation operators. So, uh, by acting on the vacuum state, this generates a string like excitation of the gravitational field. Which is given by this Wilson loop, and also one can act on this uh, one uh, as this, this, this one exit, uh, one uh, string excitation by the by another Wilson loop operator and gets a two excited state, and this goes on and so forth. And also on this, uh, also the on the surface, Constantine, if I may ask you, so what will annihilate the vacuum here, and what will create the so what is the operator which will annihilate the vacuum? Um, Um, uh, yeah, so this uh, would be uh, given by these operators here, by these electric fluxes. So certain variations of the selective fluxes will indeed annihilate this. For instance, the gas constraint is some, or the morphism constraint, these are yeah, the, basically the gas constraint is one operator, which is some combinations of electric fluxes, which indeed uh, uh, annihilates this vacuum state. And this in fact, just- I Call that again electric flux. So I'm not pretty my pretty sure your your mm. accent. I'm getting it mixed up. Yeah, so the, is, you called it what electric flux? Yeah, we call this. Of course, you can do the same formalism on electrodynamics on curved space time, and you also get this similar picture. And then E in analogy, we, we call this E electric flux. So gravitational electric flux. It's uh, just analogy because you obtain the same picture. In, oh, it's okay. In QED. I thought okay. Mm. I just don't know how you produce this stuff out of the vacuum. I'm a bit puzzled by that one on your previous. Uh, this one here? 
Yeah, but I just mi got mixed up again. I usually so, do. So this vacuum state you can interpret as a resin loop with it, uh, labeled by a trivial representation of S with two. So this is not a vacuum state. And on this, okay, yeah. On this state, you can now uh, act via wisdom loop operator, which just adds a, this wisdom loop to this to the state. And that is now the one excited state in the theory. Okay. And you can act on this state with another wisdom loop, which gives a two excited state, and so on and so forth. So this gives some string like picture, string uh, fog like picture of the theory. So the loop is actually a string that's been come back on itself. Is that what that the argument? Yeah. So. Uh, so why are we considering this business loops because they are gauge invariant. So because we have to impose these constraints and then it's natural to impose gauge invariants via these business loops. But we, in fact, we will, so the whole Hilbert space, which is constructed in this way as another a nice uh, basis in terms of so-called spinetric states. And these are indeed, or can also have open strings. So the network, I will come to this. Okay. Yeah, so these uh, wisdom loops act as kind of uh, creation operators and the selected fluxes kind of derivations by uh, uh, creating internal in, internal index and then contracting this with this mirroring function at the point of intersection. Now it turns out that it composes a diffeomorphism invariance of this vacuum state that this representation after unitary equivalence is indeed the uh, unique representation. This goes back to the famous loss theorem. So now studying the Hilbert space, one then finds that uh, a building, main building blocks given by orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space is given by so-called spin network states. So spin network states can be represented in case, uh, as, uh, as these uh, graphs embedded in, uh, in the space in the, in the cauchy hypersurfaces, and the edges carry certain uh, carry now a certain spin quantum numbers J of the SO2 gauge group, and these intersect at certain vertices. And interestingly, these spin network states were invented completely independently a uh, long time ago by Penrose in the uh, 1970s. And here now they form, they arise naturally in terms of orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space, of the Akuchi Hilbert space, which arises from this fog like, uh, fog -like uh, representation of the Hamilton flux algebra. And these uh, uh, spin network states can regard as uh, are associated to gauge invariant functionals of the uh, SO2 gauge field, so this Astrica connection. So for instance, if you consider a, um, a spin network graph given by two three valent vertices, they represent certain spin quantum numbers. The, uh, the spin, network, uh, uh, spin network state is the function of A and uh, is obtained by the product of certain matrix coefficients of the reduced representations of, uh, of the SO2 and uh, evaluated on the allonomies, so the parallel transport map induced by this gauge field along these edges. And then in order to get a gauge invariant quantity, one contracts these internal indices while with respect to some intertwiner. And then this way one gets a gauge invariant functional on this of the SO2 uh, of the SO2 connection. Now also we can define an inner product on Hilbert space and finds that this that these spin network, spin network states indeed provide an orthonormal basis of the whole Hilbert space. This is by this is obtained by this famous Peter Weiss theorem. Okay, and now as an immediate consequence of the spin metric states, it now follows that this leads to quantization of geometry. So for instance, you could consider the area quantity. So you have some, some surface S embedded in sigma. So the, for instance, the surface here, and uh, the area of the surface it turns out can be re completely re-expressed in terms of the dual electric field. So the canonical conjugate momentum of this SU2 connection, A, the Ashtika connection. So based on this observation, one can then implement this rigorously in terms of a well-defined operator in the quantum theory. And then one finds that the area operator associated to a surface S here, acting on a Wilson loop labeled by spin quantum number J, which intersects the surface at, a, at one particular point. One finds that these uh, one excited states are indeed eigenstates of this area operator with these eigenvalues, depending on this uh, spin quantum number J labeling this, uh, this Wilson loop. So when we get uh, this way, this is in fact to quantization of geometries when it has a discrete area spectrum, so which has a uh, lowest possible area eigenvalue and uh, becomes indeed almost uh, continuous in, in the limit of large chain. 
So this quantization leads into to quantization of geometry, so in quantization of area in this case, and also the same applies to, uh, to the volume. So considering a certain region R, we can also re-express the volume of this region R in terms of uh, the electric field. And then one can again implement this in the quantum theory, but then effectively the, the resulting operator is much more complicated and the eigenstates, uh, the eigenvalues are not uh, known in generality. But also in, the, in this case, one finds that the volume operator can be uh, can be rewritten in terms of a sum of uh, operators which are localized at the uh, at the at the vertices of the spin network graph, and uh, sum of all vertices which are contained in that region. So these operators, this, this volume operator now acts on the on the uh, on the spin network vertices. Also, this leads to a quantization of the volume spectrum. Constantine, maybe the yeah. question. So Huri is asking a question, and I have a question. Maybe Huri, please go ahead. Yes. Uh... Here in, in in this part of your talk, uh, huh? you are uh, you are considering um, at a fixed time, or because because there is no yeah. apparently there is no time here. So, so far, I'm considering the quantization of a particular space-like hypersurface, but then we will also have to impose constraints. For instance, in particular, a Hamiltonian constraint, and this will regain this covariant picture. And we will, I will talk about this. Yeah. Okay, do, do you do you talk about how do you define a clock, a quantum clock? I know, yeah, 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 okay, okay, that's true. So in the quantum theory, in order to get uh, to, to somehow get, um, to get a proper um, idea on, on time evolution, actually has to introduce matter fields as clock fields, and then, you know, because the semitonic constraint, because in general relativity, um, we have this uh, background independence, so dimorphism invariance, and so on. This is the context. Uh, uh, we can um, redefine time by a different choice of, uh, of, of, a, of a chart. And so time is just, uh, is, uh, so this is Hamiltonian constraint is associated to a, um, to a gauge transformation in a way. So gauge is, so the Hamiltonian becomes a constraint in a theory, not a physical Hamiltonian. Yeah, but I think there is there is one uh, more yeah. fundamental problem here, and that is that if you want to define uh, properly a proper quantum clock, you need to be able to define first subsystems in your in the in the universe, and this I think that we can discuss later. It is one of the problems of uh, of the. Uh, background independent approaches, huh? but we can discuss it later. Please continue. Yeah, yeah maybe let's discuss this afterwards then. But it's a very interesting question, yes. So, so constantly the question which yeah. I have, so once you get your area and uh, volume, mm -hmm. um, and since it's a background independent, so it's all, <laughs> it only depends on your index J, it's a spin index essentially yeah. J, so highest spin. But uh, um, so at this, this is a non-perturbative statement, uh, so it's fair enough. Yes. But at the end of the day, if you want to bring into the perturbative uh, level, means the low, uh, you know, low energy, yeah. then uh, I have to associate this area with some area given the metric. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I should be able to even uh, recover my limits of the Minkowski. So is it possible to see this? Or maybe it's not possible to see this at this point? Yeah. Um... I think I will explain this in a bit, uh, in some rough way, and of course, maybe come back to this question. Okay. Can I can I just ask a quick yeah. question at this point? So this a, this area and volume is area and volume of what the whole the whole uh, space like hypersurface? Or, no, no. Or? certain sub uh, hyper, um, uh, some two dimensional uh, sub um, two dimensional surfaces embedded in the in this space like hypersurface. Okay, okay. This could be any uh, no. subset, uh, two dimensional. Okay, okay. Um, okay, okay, continue. Mm -hmm. So it now follows that these uh, spin networks, uh, spin network states lead to a quantization of geometry because now volume uh, area becomes quantized and localized at the edges, and volume is quantized and is localized at the vertices. So effectively, if you uh, consider a spin network vertex, uh, the area becomes quantized and localized at the edges and depends a certain way on the spin quantum J associated to these edges and incident, incident in this vertex. Also, the volume becomes quantized and uh, is localized at the vertex. And effectively, it now follows that this uh, spin network vertex, in this case, a four-valent vertex, can be 
different can be described in dually via a quantized polyhedron. So now it follows in this formalism that uh, space time a space becomes discretized in terms of a discrete network of quantized polyhedra. So space is kind of a molecule with many building blocks given by quantized polyhedra. And if you consider a certain, uh, yeah, maybe I already say this at this point, so you can consider certain coherent states. Uh, and then you find that in the limit of large J, that these quantized polyhedra satisfy the same geometry as a, as a classical uh, polyhedron in classical Romanian geometry. So in this limit of large J, these quantized polyhedra lead back to uh, standard classical polyhedra of uh, standard Romanian geometry. So in this way, you regain uh, approximately classical metrics. So are you envisaging that these, what you call atoms of space, are you envisaging that they will have independent uh, existence from each other? Or uh, less than they somehow join up to form? Yes, they are joined up. So in this picture, they're joined up because these um, you have the same quantum numbers, J, and the, uh, these... Uh, these intertwiners localized at the, at the vertices. They will plug vertices. together, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, but is it possible that they can become independent? Well, I don't know what yes. that some sort of high energy. Yes. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. So there's another approach I, I already mentioned, I think. So the scope fit theory approach, which is tries to construct it? the theory from a quantum theory. So you gain this classical theory from a quantum theory uh, yeah. from the beginning. And this context, one can study, for instance, um, Condensates, uh, group field theory condensates, so build up space in terms of condensates. And these uh, states do not have these um, main building blocks, are again, polyhedra, but this polyhedra do, do not have to be connected in a certain way. So this is not imposed in this case. Yeah, but so, there, so there indeed are states where, where the main building blocks are not, uh, where the main building blocks, uh, the tetraedra, do not have to be uh, glued together. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in this context, they are glued together via these spin network edges. Okay. Can I so when while this picture is up, can I quickly ask something? So so the 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 connectivity of the space time that you're getting out of this uh, mm -hmm. the locality is entirely decided by the spin network, which 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 spins are connected to which other ones by uh, mm -hmm. at a vertex. Is, is that right? Yes. Is that kind of picture. Okay. Yeah. And and it is just given as a state. So there is no Hamiltonian for the evolution of this network, right? It is just a, uh, it, it is given by the, the spin J's and uh, and the graph, right? Yeah, so far, there's no dynamics. Okay. okay, I see, I see. But I will come to dynamics. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now maybe we come also to the other question, how to, uh, how to quantize uh, metal degrees of freedom. So in the canonical approach, we can also quantize meta degrees of freedom. So for instance, in context of fermions, uh, it follows that now quantized fermions are localized at the vertices of the spin network graph. So um, yeah, so these quantized fermion degrees of freedom are localized at the vertices. And in the supersymmetric setting, we in fact encountered a different quantization scheme and uh, it arose quite naturally in the formalism. Maybe I have some time to also discuss this later on. Now, so far this was completely kinematical. In fact, we now have also to impose the constraints. So we have the Gauss constraint and the Gauss constraint uh, generating infinitesimal gauge transformations now imposed uh, automatically because we have uh, these Wilson loops and spin network states, which are gauge invariant functionals. But also we have the diffeomorphism constraint, which generates infinitesimal uh, diffeomorphism in uh, in transformations in the space, space like hypersurfaces. But there it turns out that these cannot be quantized rigorously in the quantum theory. But, in, on the, but it turns out that we can uh, implement these finite diffeomorphisms unitarily in every space. And so diffeomorphism invariant uh, states are then obtained by uh, picking a spin network state and group averaging the state over the whole group manifold. So the, uh, this diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism group manifold. And this way one gets a diffeomorphism invariant spin network state. And so in diffeomorphism invariant Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space, uh, two spin network states are considered as equivalent if they are related by diffeomorphism transformations. But uh, they are considered as distinct if they are topologically inequivalent. So for instance, a spin network, vertex, a spin network um, 
graph contains a, a, a not, so these are the topological equivalent, so they are considered as distinct states. Finally, one has also, also to impose the Hamiltonian constraint, which governs the, the, the dynamics of the theory. But this uh, quantization turns out to be quite complicated. So the, uh, one has like, ambiguities how to implement this in the quantum theory, and the interpretation of the solution is, uh, solutions is quite complicated. And, but one uh, standard proposal is given by Thiemann, which results, uh, re it results into an operator which creates new loops. So for instance, uh, you could consider a, a four-valent vertex and by acting, uh, by acting with this uh, quantized uh, Newtonian constraint on this uh, four-valent vertex, this now creates new uh, new loops. Uh, for instance, connecting two by connecting uh, two edges into that at, at this vertex in, in three different ways, and by relabeling re these I guess spin network edges, and now summing up all these possibilities. And this gives now the action of the Hamiltonian constraint in the Tiemann's proposal. Now, in order to get an idea how these solutions in fact look like, so how this time evolution of spin network states now looks like in this formalism. One can follow the ideas of Rovelli and Rosenberger, uh, Reisenberger and define an operator p on the physical subspace of the full kinematical Hilbert space, given by those uh, spinetric states which solve the, uh, the, the constraints, in particular Hamiltonian constraint. And this physical this projection operator can be re-expressed formally in terms of a, a product of data distributions, uh, validated at the uh, Contract with this uh, quantized Hamiltonian constraint and the product of all the points x in space. And then, since one can formally re express this delta distribution uh, in terms of the free transform, one can re express this in terms of the functional integral of the lapse function n times e of the exponential of i times the integral of the, uh, the smearing of this constraint operator with the smearing function of the uh, with this lapse function n. Then, by formally expanding this in a power series, one gets a power series of the uh, in the constraint uh, an Hamiltonian constraint operator. Now, using this power series expansion, one can then uh, compute the uh, compute the scattering uh, the amplitude or the transition amplitude between two physical states given by the projection of these spinetric states onto the physical subspace of the Hilbert space, and then. Using, the, using this expansion of this uh, projection to be physical in this power series of the Hamiltonian constraint, it now follows that the terms and riddle terms appearing in this uh, transition amplitude can be effectively re-expressed re in terms of these uh, two cells, these two complexes, the two complexes. These are the so-called spin forms. So the spin forms describe the time evolution of uh, spin network states. Yes, and- yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, so if you go one slide, uh... Before, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, or maybe even so, what you uh, told us that your basic structure is uh, a structure is your polyhedra kind of structure for space time. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about space time index. Um, so, uh, so essentially, a manifold. If I think about, it, they are basically the manifold is constituents of uh, also the uh, polyhedra constituents of your manifold. Now. Mm -hmm. So, if that's the case, then um, um, how, I mean. What is the point, or I mean, what is the logic behind using the Dirac delta function? Because distribution, not the function, but Dirac delta, delta distribution. Mm -hmm. Because in your case, you know it already that uh, at a given point, I mean, you don't have a notion of a point as such, but you have a distribution already, which is polyhedra. So, what exactly this expansion delta x means then? Actually, to take the product of all spatial points, this is just a formal one. So this is just a formal way how to interpret solutions of this of this constraint. So, yes. So C of X uh, uh, contains what essentially? Yeah, it contains all uh, the constraint operator at all points in space. But um, but every point in space is related to your some. You have a structure which is polyhedra, kind of like. Yes. So if you um, now consider a quantized geometry, so you have some spin network boundary here, which is at, at, some, at some point in space, at space time, uh, yeah, and this decomposition, then, then you can, this is the result you obtain from this, uh, from this uh, operator, so from this, of this power series expansion of this physical projection operator. And now this, because for instance, you consider one term here, so you act with this operator on a spin network state, so we act with uh, with this um, Hamiltonian constraint once, and since it's Hamiltonian constraint, 
generates this uh, these loops. So, uh, so one vertex is is uh, replaced now by uh, three, another three three valent vertex. So here, this edge here and this vertex here of the spinnet graph is now split up into two into three new vertices. This comes from the action of one Hamiltonian constraint. So this gives in one level here, and you can again act with another Hamiltonian constraint. So this gives this term here. And I get another vertex. So in this way, uh, and in order to compute the transition amplitude between between two spinetric states, so in this case we have a spinetric vertex, uh, spinetric graph consisting of two, three trivalent vertices, and here we have uh, 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 six trivalent vertices. And this can be obtained by acting twice with the Hamiltonian constraint on two distinct steps. Now you have to. Uh, sum up all possibilities to get from this boundary state to this boundary state. And this gives the transition amplitude between one spin network boundary to the other one. This is how the time evolution is now described in this formalism. This is now just in a formal way how to gain this picture. Sorry, uh, yeah. this construction of, uh, I mean, um, physical state and, uh, mm. and so on, uh, how much this is dependent on the fact that uh, you're considering a three-dimensional space. For instance, if the space was space, not the space time, but just the space was four-dimensional or whatever, mm. n-dimensional, how much really all this construction could be extended? Because all of it is mostly related to the fact that you are considering that the symmetry of a three-dimensional space is SU2. Uh, yes. So you mean how you can generalize this to include space, higher space and dimensions, or yes, for instance, for instance, uh, n-dimensional, whatever. Mm. N. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so, uh, so that there exists a formalism invented by Bodendorfer, Thiemann, and Turin, who found that there exist indeed these Ashtika Bavero type variables also in higher space and dimensions. And then you can again build up this picture also in the same way, just. Uh, now E is canonical conjugate to a uh, D minus two form. So you can consider, uh, actually you consider um, high dimensional surfaces for electric fluxes, but again, one dimensional string like citations. But also in three space and dimensions, you have these pictures. And then uh, in fact, there you have, uh, yeah, maybe uh, they have uh, there's some nice properties. Maybe I'll explain this. So you can generalize this to arbitrary space and dimensions. Okay, thanks. The symmetry would not be any more SU2 or no. US, yeah. SOD. SOD, SOD yeah, okay, yes. But the, uh, this is more uh, approach to, to uh, what's called the, the, the group field, uh, the, uh, the group manifold. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. So now these uh, spin forms can be regarded as kind of Feynman diagrams, which describe the transition amplitude between two spin network boundaries. And the uh, lines are now two dimensional and are labeled by SO2 group, uh, SO2 gauge group ele uh, elements instead of the uh, uh, individual superstations of the boundary group. So this is an analogy which appears in this formalism. Now, so far, this was the canonical approach. So, studying the so can I just yeah. quickly ask so, so is the time is running in the vertical direction, right? Bottom to top, is that? Yes, this, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, this is one spinner boundary and uh, the transition from this right. to the other one in the future. Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. But there's I some difficulty in how to get in patient interpretation of uh, time. So actually I've neglected this sort of, in there of time really when has actually introduced some reference fields. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but so this, this, time, hmm? this transition is is it a bit more like just a unitary matrix having acted on it kind of thing, right? Like a S matrix uh, yes. without any magnitude of time. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So far, this was the canonical approach. So studying quantization of three-dimensional hyper um, three hypersurfaces and then studying, uh, studying the uh, Hamiltonian dynamics to regain this covariant picture. But now there's also another approach, the so-called covariant approach, in which uh, now studies the quantization of the four-dimensional theory from the beginning. 
And there one uses the observation that the host action of gravity can be rewritten in terms of a constraint field theory by, by introducing some two-dimensional, uh, some two-form field B, the so-called B field, which takes value in the Lorentz algebra. And so in this way, we can define an action principle, which is a B wedge F type action with plus some additional constraint term, which depends on some Lagrangian multiplier, which depends in a certain way on the Mises parameter and has certain symmetries, in such a way that this imposes a constraint on the B field so-called simplicity constraint. And this relates the B field to the co-frame. And then by uh, reinserting this, uh, this constraint into the B field here, one finds that this indeed leads back to the host action of gravity. So if one takes a closer look on this B wedge F term, one observes that this is in fact a topological theory with well-known quantum theory, the so-called BF theory. In the context of two plus one dimensions, one finds that this is equivalent to gravity with gauge group SO1 two. So the idea was now to uh, quantize this theory by uh, quantizing first, uh, discretizing first this uh, BF path integral induced by this uh, topological BF action, and then afterwards implement this uh, the simplicity constraint. And this goes back to ideas from Bernard and Crane. And so one now considers the path integral induced by this uh, BF action. So the BF path integral, which is uh, in a, a function integral on the B field and, and the Lorentz connection. E to the uh, i times the, uh, the BF action. Now, one uses the observation that this E term can be uh, reinterpreted as a, can be re-expressed in terms of, a, a, it can be guided as kind of a free transform of, a, of the data distribution. So, can, so one can replace this function integral of the, uh, the B, uh, over the B field um, in terms of this data distribution related on the, on the curvature of the connection omega. So this imposes a flatness constraint. And now this, uh, this functional integral can be discretized by choosing a triangulation of space-time. So we're going to choose the triangulation of space-time in order to, to discretize uh, this action functional. And one also discretizes now the, uh, using this triangulation, one discretizes these, uh, this uh, spin connection omega via allonomies along, uh, along the edges around these uh, long faces, uh, which are dual to, the, uh, to, to the edges of the triangulation. So these intersect at the edges dually here. And the delta distribution can be expressed in terms of the sum of characters of the SO2 gauge group. And then by integrating out these characters, we find that the path integral, okay, in case of three space time dimensions, becomes a product, a uh, sum of a uh, product of certain tetrahedra. And it is, uh, so the, the corners of the tetrahedra are localized at the corners of, of these phases dual to the, dual to the triangulation. And are labeled by certain irreducible representations of the underlying gauge group. And these uh, tetrahedra correspond to six J symbols. So, so, the, so the weakness six J symbols, and which are obtained by the uh, evaluation of spin network graphs, so, uh, which arise from these edges induced by these faces. So these edges create a, effectively a dual spin network graph. And these are functionals of, of the SO2 gauge group, of this SO2 gauge connection. And so by evaluating this on the unity, one gets the six J symbols. And something similar appears in the four space and dimensions. In that case, one has to replace this by a hyper tetrahedron, so four dimensions, so a four, a, four, a, a four cell, a four simplex. So a tetrahedron in four space and dimensions. So this is the quantization of the topological field theory. Now, actually, gravity is not a, is not a topological field theory, but uh, we have so we have to impose uh, the simplicity constraint. Actually, there are various proposals how to implement this, and uh, the, the one proposal which is commonly used in, uh, in this formalism is given by the so-called EPRL FK vertex amplitude, named after Engel, Pereira, Roveli, Levin, Friedel, and Krasnov. There, one uses the observation that. Uh, by solving the simplicity constraint, this requires to choose a particular subclass of irreducible representations of the Lorentz group SO13. So, and then these representations are, arise via the lift of certain irreducible representations of SO2 to the Lorentz group. And this is induced by the Y map. So the Y map lifts a spin network states. As spin network states, which are labeled by SO2 group elements, uh, SO2 irreducible representations to uh, spin, network, spin network states, which are labeled by um, irreducible representations of the SO2 C gauge group. And these are obtained by a lift of certain SO2 IREPs to the SO13 IREPs. 
And this way, one gets a re-expression re of this uh, path integral in terms of so-called vertex amplitudes. So effectively, this covariant picture leads to, uh, to a spin form, which arises from uh, the uh, time evolution of SU2 spinnetal graphs. And this is uh, very similar to the picture that we have obtained in the canonical approach. And in fact, it can be proven in three space and dimensions that these two pictures are indeed equivalent. So the spin network, the spin forms which arise in this uh, from this covariant approach are indeed equivalent to those which are obtained via the time evolution of spin network states in the, uh, in the in the canonical approach. This has been proven in three space dimensions, but in context of four space dimensions, this is still under debate. So finally, I would like to give a uh, I give a summary of, of results of AKG, which point out that the theory might be indeed uh, on the right track. So on the one hand, as I said, the theory seems to have indeed the right uh, classical limit. So for instance, in the canonical formulation, it turns out that by considering certain Korean states, localized at, uh, at certain vertices of, uh, of, these, uh, of the spinnetic graph, that the limit of large J that the quantized geometry leads back, in fact, to the classical geometry. So this quantized polyhedra correspond to the limit of large J to classical to, to, to classical polyhedra in classical remaining geometry. So this is one result one obtains in the canonical theory. So the green states describe approximately classical metrics. Also in the covariant approach, one finds that these, um, these six J symbols and these, um, uh, these uh, hyper -poly polyhedra Indeed, correspond to discrete Reggie correspond, correspond to discrete Reggie action. So, uh, discretization of uh, the path integral of the Einstein Hilbert action via choosing of a triangulation. And this uh, also can be obtained in the limit of large J. Now, as in context of cosmology, one finds that this leads to a resolution of, uh, of singularities. So, for instance, the Big Bang singularity is replaced by a big bounce. And also, one gets a consistent picture of the inflationary phase of the universe. In the context of three space time dimensions, one finds that the canonical and the covariant approach are indeed both equivalent and uh, indeed coincide with standard quantization techniques. One knows from Jim Simon's theory, for instance, the combinatorial quantization scheme or the geometric quantization scheme. All these coincide with this quantization scheme one has from one obtains from this canonical and or covariant approach of the PQG. And finally, also uh, black holes have been considered, and also there one has found uh, uh, one has computed, for instance, the entropy of a very, of a large class of physical black holes, and one has found a coincidence with the semi-classical results obtained by Einstein and Hawking. And also if some, I, if I may say here, so by so here, uh, I think the resolution of singularity should not even appear because by construction, your manifold which you are constructing is a regular manifold from the very construction. So. By I mean, by definition, there is no singularity in the manifold to begin with. Yeah, because the um, main, uh, the, so the smallest possible quantum of space you have is one polyhedra. Mm -hmm. Essentially, these are, so, yeah. so, so and this induces this bounce. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, this is an, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, from the very beginning, from the the structure itself has uh, smooth yeah. manifold. Mm -hmm. But from in, this, in these cosmological models, one normally considers, so we actually assumes, so actually, uh, this depends on how you approach this. So in the standard approach, you actually consider already homogeneous space times and then apply equity like techniques, but you do not regain this picture from the full theory. Then you have to actually implement some ideas to got from the full theory, and then you see this bounce, but this is not a picture you clearly get from the full theory. But uh, there are newer results which study the full theory and uh, so which study the, uh, the symmetry reduction of the full th on, on the full theory, and then you get this picture you, you're able to describe this. But there's a debate on uh, uh, how to relate uh, how um, this quantization scheme based on uh, already. Considering spatially um, uh, symmetry reduced uh, manifold uh, the classical level and then quantizing or quantizing then symmetry reducing uh, symmetry reduction this symmetry reduction yeah that's so how these two pictures coincide this um, yeah. and finally there are also uh, recent results on how to resolve singularities appearing in black holes and also there one finds that uh, singularities are resolved in this formalism. 
Okay, uh, yeah, actually the time is over. I just would like to say, so I studied the, uh, my, own result, and my own research was based on, uh, on uh, applying EQG techniques to the context of supergravity. And there we, uh, one of the things we found that uh, this leads to a different picture on how to quantize, for instance, fermionic degrees of freedom. So in this picture, you know, fermionic degrees of freedom are uh, smeared along edges, along the edges in contrast to the standard picture. So they're inverted, the fermionic degrees of freedom were, were quantized on the vertices. And also we get some quantization of a graded variant of the area quantity. So some generalization of channel geometry, so super geometry. And then we found that uh, we can, for instance, study supersymmetric black holes. And there we found that uh, we can describe uh, the boundary degrees of freedom in terms of certain would be case degrees of freedom induced by these uh, generalized uh, SUSI spin networks. And we found that this leads to, for instance, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy for supersymmetric black holes. So we get this, so some supersymmetric generalization of this formalism to uh, the theory. But this was it. Okay, that's it. Thanks, thank you very much, Constantine, for a very nice talk. And uh, as you gave a very simple uh, picture of the loop quantum gravity. We have already had some couple of good questions. And please, if you have more questions, this is the time to ask speaker. Please raise your hand and just ask. So, so maybe I would I would just like to understand the the picture uh, a bit better. Um, mm -hmm. So. The, so when you also placed fermions in the in the vertices, right? Mm -hmm. So am I to understand the the locality of uh, space time? What, what emerges like with, with fields interacting at the same point uh, in space time, right? Am mm -hmm. I to understand that really as as the same locality as the graph uh, on, on on which these these volumes are next to each other? Is, is the mapping? direct mapping or, or is it a more abstract mapping does the does the locality in the in the graph correspond to the the locality of the space time that is emerging yeah so um interacting with uh, fermions are localized at the same vertex of a spin network graph so in the sense they are localized at the vertices yeah so so for two fields to interact they must be in the same vertex is yes. that Right. Yeah, um, but they also somehow can, yeah, but they're also somehow connected by the Newtonian constraint. So the yeah. Newtonian constraint can connect to, ah. to distinct vertices to some single vertex also. Right, right. Uh, at a different time, you they can evolve. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they can uh, evolve to a to a. Right, and what is the what is like the the speed of light here? I mean, how do you? incorporate that like a light cone yeah the light cone becomes fuzzled so you have actually not a so uh, the geometry is some dynamical object so you actually uh, so and also quantum theory so you have to not have a specific light cone but they somehow fuzzled but yeah this um but uh, constantine about this question of locality because your inherent mm -hmm. objects are wilsonian operator so inherent uh, inherently your system your uh, you know your Quantization scheme is non-local to begin with. Yes. So uh, it's not obvious to me then uh, how the uh, you reserve you uh, you know you get the locality. In what limit do you get the locality? This is not clear to me. Hmm. Because after all, you're uh, you started with the Wilsonian operator. Um. So you mean how to get from Wilson loops to these spin graphs or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, and these all these operators are non-local here. So operators are non-local uh, and when it acts on a vacuum, okay, vacuum could be my abstract in a Hilbert space, it may live mm -hmm. or in Fox space, but these operators, when they act on this vacuum, it generates you again a non-local, um, you know, uh, quantities. Yes. So actually, um, you can consider. Uh, so this is some simplified picture here. So you can. Um, so you have these Wilson loop observables, which are generic, okay, kitchen variant, but you can also consider uh, general holonomies, so any parallel transport map along any any kind any any kind of edges you would like to consider. 
So, and so these actually all build up the Hilbert space, yes. And then you can uh, join these different uh, edges in a way, in a gauge way, and then you get these penetrate graphs. Sure, that, that I can do, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. But the question is where exactly my spins are embedded, that we don't know. I mean, because that could be anywhere in this uh, uh, area or in a volume. What do you mean how the spins are embedded? Like exactly, let's think about the, you know, the, I mean, electron, I mean, as a, and a spin of an electron. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. it a distribution. It's not like that the electron exists in a given point. Uh, the spin is associated to a point. Yeah, how do you begin this? Classically, I cannot define, I mean, even, even classically, mm -hmm. it's hard. I mean, electron is spin. I mean, that's why electron is not a classical system. I cannot define a spin. Yes. And because it, so here you have a come across you have come across that problem by saying that there is an area and yes for a given area you can define some kind of spin to that or you can associate some spin because hmm. spin is angular momentum is uh, in physical space time is r cross p so you can have uh, but my point is that uh, is this still local this is the where you are defining the, where you are you know you have the spins are embedded hmm. are those really local uh, space time or there is some kind of some smearing of your space time going on. In a way, you are smearing this by proposing this morphism covariance. So actually, you do not consider a tetrahedron at a specific space time point, but just uh, actually, so these spinetric graphs do not, um, are not really, uh, so these are not uh, like a lattice. These are not lattices with specified lattice length. I see. So, uh, only data here that you have is the relation of the connectivity between two vertices, so to be different, two different points in space. This is the only information that you have. I see. But so even this is exactly how where the where the spins are embedded at this point. You're saying. Yeah. So uh, the only thing that you know is the connectivity between these points. But uh, even and even this is uh, actually even this is not uh, uh, not in, uh, encoded in this because you have morphism covariance. Uh, if these points are moved uh, along any way, mm -hmm. manifold, but in a topological equivalent way, so you do not form knots. So, 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 so I, you are saying that these are not localized uh, yes. systems. Yes. By, uh, by by definition, they are not localized systems. Yes, uh, I see. I see. Okay. So, is is diffeomorphism invariance here just equivalent to topological? Equivalence, or is it more uh, more uh, constrained or more constrained? Uh, actually a bit less? So we actually not just consider smooth morphisms, so not any any uh, continuous homomorphism. But uh, in this group fifth year approach, you indeed consider any kind of uh, embedding. So you have these partner moves, and so you really consider. Yeah. Also... Gin and tonics. That's that nice clear pool. And yet we've got no peaceful. <laughs> The sorry, I think I. Did sorry, that. sorry. No, no, there was some. Uh, someone had uh, uh, kept his. Um, uh, mm. I did not mute the audio. That's that was it. Okay. So, and the fact that uh, so the another question is, as you said, uh, your light cone itself is not very well defined. That shows uh, that kind of like manifests that there is some amount of non-locality. Yes. I mean, the fluctuation of space time itself manifests itself in some form of non local that you cannot define a particular point uh, or, uh, I mean, okay, time in the evolution, but at least for a particular point is not very well defined quantity in, in this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But it can, of course, describe interaction of two different points, at least the relation between two different points in terms of. Two different, yeah, that, that def definitely, or maybe two different uh, regions of space time yeah. you can define. Are oh, they explicitly located in space? This is uh, not not mm -hmm. defined in this, mm -hmm. but you can describe uh, interaction of uh, two fermions at two different vertices. But the, the, but the manifold is remains smooth. So what is happening is the manifold is smooth, but the the fields on the manifold have some uh, this non-local behavior, or the manifold itself is non-local. What, what what will be your opinion? Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, um, actually, even in this formalism, you have to uh, weaken this topology, uh, this smoothness structure. So you actually consider a semi-analytic surface uh, manifolds because you have to somehow uh, 
ensure that uh, you don't have infinitely many, infinitely many intersection between edges and surfaces. So you have to yeah, choose a different category of smoothness. I see. So it's not a C infinite smooth manifold per se. Yes. So you have to, yeah, you have to give up on that. Okay. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So, there's, so essentially, this is in a way what you're saying is that the level of manifold you are, uh, you are bringing in some kind of like a non local structure. Yes. Good. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, uh, is there any other question from uh, the audience? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I have, have a question. I mean, again, going back to my previous question, mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the, there are two main problem uh, which, which is discussed uh, in, the, in the literature uh, about loop quantum gravity. And one is that uh, why dimension three? It does mm -hmm. not explain why the, Dimension of the space is three, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. second, the in the whole formulation, the 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 the, the covariance, the Lorentz covariance, uh, or the homomorphism covariance, is is quite it's quite uh, hidden, and I'm not sure that it's uh, people uh, agree that it it is all uh, always uh, respected. Do you, can can you comment on this? Maybe first on your on the first question. So why four space time dimensions or three spatial dimensions? Yes. So uh, yes, yes, it's so it's true that it fact can uh, fi find these Ashtaka Barrow like variables for any space time dimensions, but only in four space time dimensions, at least so far, uh, still of uh, the present status of the, of the research. Is that only in four space time dimensions these are indeed uh, natural these variables? So in in, in in so if you consider higher space time dimensions, you have to make a lot of choices, and this is just a very uh, yeah, so the, uh, the the problem of naturality is not important. The point okay. is that uh, why three, why not something else? Because that only in this is case, natural or not? Because only in this case you can derive this from this host. So this host, or this host action can only be, only be formulated in four space dimensions. And this depend, and this is related to the dimension of the Lorentz algebra. So the Lorentz algebra is four, uh, so one three. So you have these four indices. And only in this case you can formulate this host action, uh, this host term here. Yeah. So this host action only exists in four space time dimensions, but not in uh, higher space time dimensions. So I think Hori's point is that can I? Um... Uh, so yeah, and uh, I think this point is absolutely correct. But uh, maybe the Hori would like to understand that could could you write something analogous to your whole action in any arbitrary yeah. dimensions? And the answer yeah. is perhaps yes, but it may not be unique. I think. I mean, yes, you can you can extend it to other dimensions. You can, uh, but all of this does not explain why what we observe is three. Yeah, that, that is a fair point. I think there is, we don't have any theory which can tell us like that. You can uh, also ask the question, why not just two times or 10 times? Not two, not 10, whatever. Yeah, so I think that we don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is any theory which hmm. explains that well enough right now. Um, okay. Maybe there is. <laughs> We don't have like string theory, which uh, requires. Well, string theory has, has I mean, it, it is the most problematic uh, subject in string theory, which brings all the complexity. It cannot, uh, it cannot exist in, uh, in, uh, in the dimensionality of a space that we, are, we observe. Well, at least it can, it can predict that we, there has to be 10 space time dimensions, 11 space time dimensions, but also does not explain why we have to reduce to four space time dimensions. Yeah, yeah. a lot of com complexity. And second was my, my question was the covariance in, in all, in all, uh, I mean, uh, so circumstances. So covariance yeah, is, of course, so in order to um, construct this canonical approach, we have to choose some gauge. So we have to uh, uh, choose the time, we have to choose the so-called time gauge. So in this way, we somehow uh, lose this covariance. But since we are now imposing this imponent constraint, we regain this covariant picture. So the 
full theory after imposing a metonic constraint uh, leads to a covariant theory. And the fully covariant theory is obtained in this covariant approach. So there you really study the four dimensional theories, so the quantization of the full from the four dimensional theory. And you do not choose in particular any time gauge. But it's, it's true that in canonical theory, this covariance is not fully reflected. So you do not, at least you do not observe this in an analysis way. You really have to choose a time gauge and then quantize, but you regain this after imposing constraints. Can I ask this. a short question? Uh, is there any specific uh, prediction for experiments? So we, uh, yeah, so it's fair to say that, uh, so you cannot, you, you do not get quantities. So ex ex exact quantities which say that if you observe this, uh, you measure this quantity, that the theory might be true. So for instance, like um, uh, like diffraction, solar eclipse or so, like in GR. So you do not get a specific value that you would like to measure. But you, there are some, at least some um, predictions uh, although, although, although these are not uh, settled at this point, but uh, there's some predictions which indicate uh, whether if you observe this, this somehow points out that the space time may be indeed quantized or discretized in a certain way on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Planck scale. This, for instance, these, uh, I, mean, I think the best known examples is this, uh, is this um, change of, um, uh, how it's called, um, so dependence of uh, of the um, angular velocity on um, on the wavelength uh, wave number. Uh, yeah, but yeah, this is this is uh, quite a strongly uh, constrained. Yeah, so it does. It depends on uh, which models you consider. So you cannot get a specific value out of this. You just get a some a, some um, some phenological, phenological prediction of this, but you don't get a specific value that says that says that this AQG approach is the right approach for this, for this one. But there are some uh, results that indicate that you might be too true. For instance, you get a consistent picture of uh, the microstates on black holes. For instance, you a coincidence with uh, semi-classical mutations by Big Stan Hawking. So there are some results in the resolution of singularities which. Uh, which indicate the theory may be indeed uh, on the right track. But that Maybe. also uh, depends on the, the value of immersive constant. Yes, but there are different approaches. So the self-dual approach where the MISI parameter is fixed to some imaginary unit. And then you get independence on the uh, on this MISI parameter, but you get to exact this correspondence, this correspondence to the background entropy. We have studied this in supersymmetric settings. So there we have to, do not have a dependence on beta. So beta is fixed in this context. And then we also get this, uh, this black entropy. And also in the group V3 approach, you also find that uh, the back standard, this uh, black hole entropy is independent of the music parameter. And this is uh, obtained if you, by, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I have to explain, explain this a bit more detail. So normally in this canonical approach, you uh, study the classical geometry. So you assume some given uh, black hole geometry, some uh, topo topology, actually, so it's given, given topology. So you have some uh, black hole given, black hole boundary. And then you quantize the theory. So you quantize the bulk theory and you quantize the boundary theory. In that context, you compute then the microstates on the boundary and then you quick get the spectral entropy. And this depends in, in, in the standard approach on, on the music parameter. But then you assume a given topology. But there's also another approach, the group VT approach, which uh, which constructs the constructs the manifold out of main building blocks. So studying these uh, polyhedra and then the manifold which arises from this from this picture. And so there, the, the topology is not given a priori. But then you want to approximate some, for instance, spherical topologies, and then you get indeed uh, the result that this does not depend on the music parameter. So maybe if you do not, if you study this more in a full theory, so do not uh, impose any, any given topology at the beginning, you uh, resolve this dependence on the music parameter. But this is. Uh, Thank you. Good. Uh, is there any other question from? Please raise your hand and just uh, maybe ask or. Well, uh, if not, then uh, let's uh, thank the speaker today. Uh, uh, so 
Thank you very much, Konstantin. Very nice talk, very basic, but very... Uh, very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very everyone. much. Bye. Bye.